Well, as I said, we're going to be in Luke 2, 1. Uh, I'm going to read through a little segment of passage. We'll talk about it. We'll read a little bit more, and you'll kind of see how it works here. Um, and, and so if you want to follow along, Luke 2, if you don't know your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke is the third book of the New Testament. And as you can see from my Bible, it's about 75% of the way into the book. And so Luke 2, starting with verse 1, I'm going to read 1, 2, and 3, and then we'll talk about it. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his or her own town. Now you need to understand Caesar Augustus. Caesar had a political platform here that you probably won't hear in any upcoming elections, in the United States at least. You see, he announced to the Roman Empire, he basically said, read my lips, lots of new taxes, right? That's what he said. It says there in verse 1 and in verse 3 that he made a decree for everyone to go back to their own hometown to be registered. And in effect, he's saying, I need to know how many people there are in my empire so I know how much I can squeeze out of you. Now, of course, the the difference between Caesar Augustus and our, our modern politicians is that Caesar was not elected in any sort of way. He wasn't elected by the people. He didn't have any sort of term limits. He could do whatever he wanted. And if you didn't like it, he had an army you could talk to. Right? That's the way things used to work. Might made right. He could do whatever he wanted. And here he wants to tax people. And in order to do that, in order to efficiently at least tax people... You need to know where they live. You need to know how many there are so you can collect the right amount of taxes. And so he says everybody needs to get registered. Everybody has to take part in the census. Mary and and Joseph, the parents of Jesus, they, they submitted to this, even though if you know the story of Christmas, submitting to this request had to really be a burden, right? Submitting to this request by their government had to make their lives miserable. And along the way, they run into a number of problems. Look in verses 4 through 7 at some of the troubles that Mary and Joseph experience. Verse 4 says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. They experienced so many troubles along the way here. I'm not even sure I could list all of them. First, if you're looking at verse 4, it says, They went out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. They have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which is approximately 80 miles. But they didn't have a car, right? Now I know some of you might go like, yeah, 80 miles, I could do that in under an hour, Pastor, right? How many of you? Yeah, I I know a couple of you. I'm not naming names, but all right. But they didn't have a car. They didn't have a chariot. They didn't have a horse. They didn't even have a camel. What did they have? A lowly donkey. You ever worked with a donkey before? I have. And while they are smart animals, they're not always easy to work with animals, right? And so on top of that, Mary is nine months pregnant, right? And you could hear this morning, we have a bunch of little ones here. Praise the Lord for for happy noises from children during worship. That's a blessing. We're so glad to have kids in our church. But as, as you know, if you've recently had a child or grandchildren, oh, nine months pregnant, it's not really the ideal time to be traveling 80 miles on the back of a donkey, right? And if that's not enough trouble, the second trouble we learn about here is Joseph is in the lineage of King David. Now that might not seem like trouble at first, Because, yeah, we would all like to be, you know, the descendants of kings, right? I'd like to be royalty. How about you? That would be wonderful. We want to be at least related to somebody famous, at the very least. Honestly, I don't think I'm related to anybody famous. But most of us would like that. And Joseph 
is related to perhaps the most famous Israelite of all time, the Elvis Presley of Israel, King David. See, David wrote music. Elvis, David, you got the idea, right? And being related to him, you would think, is a good thing. But trouble comes in when we realize that being a direct descendant from this royal line of David, here he should have privilege from that, right? That should make you be somebody. But instead, they're being pushed around by some egotistical, pagan, selfish Caesar who lived literally thousands of miles away. And if, if we were Joseph, we would have probably demanded our rights, right? We probably would have written to the newspaper, written some sort of editorial. We might have gotten on the phone and called our congressmen and complained to them, right? We would have at the very least complained to the local news. We would have raised an outcry about how unfair this is, right? We would have garnered support for our cause. We probably, most likely, would have posted all over Facebook about it, about how outraged we were, right? And, and, and of course, when you post on Facebook, it fixes all the problems, right? Right? Isn't that how the world works? We would have used a, a picture of our wife who was nine months pregnant and decried in outrage over how, how, how Caesar could make a woman in her condition travel 80 miles by a donkey. Right? We would have raised an outcry against the tax itself. How unfair, how unjust it is. How it was more than Caesar needed. He doesn't need all that. And how the Roman government squanders it. Why would we give it to the government? They're going to waste it anyhow buying gold toilets somewhere, right? Uh. And if we were in the royal lineage of David... Maybe we would have complained, I don't think these laws should apply to me. I should be somebody. But not Joseph, right? Joseph takes it all in stride. I mean, he, he, he goes and he hangs up a little sign in his carpentry shop that says, went to be taxed, back soon, right? Packs his suitcases, gets a donkey for Mary who's going to deliver his child any day now, and they left for Bethlehem. No complaining, no campaigning, no internet outrage, just obedience. And of course, things only get worse for them when they finally arrive in Bethlehem. You see, when you're traveling with a pregnant lady, I have a little experience with this. You don't travel as fast as you would if she wasn't pregnant, right? There's more stops involved, you can't hit all the bumps, uh, the donkey can't be at full speed. You've got to take it easy. Right? So, this trip takes them a little bit longer than they'd probably hoped or anticipated for. Which means they arrive in Bethlehem a little bit late. And when they get there, Every hotel's full. Every motel's full. Every, every hostel, every place, every inn is filled because they got there late. There's no place for them to stay. The inns are full. At the end of Luke 2 7, it says there was no room for them in the inn. Imagine Joseph, right? It can't get much more awful than this for this guy. He's had to leave his home. He's had to close up his business and shop that, that, that he makes money from. He's had to go on this 80-mile journey. He's had to take... I mean, he's got to feel awful. He's had to drag his nine-month pregnant wife 80 miles. And then to top it all off, when he arrives, when he gets there, he realizes he didn't make any reservations. Right? There's no room for him. No place to go. Can you imagine how he feels? He's not probably thinking he's in the running for husband of the year at the moment. All of his plans to provide food and shelter and, and safety for his new wife, his soon-to-be child, out the window destroyed. This isn't the way to start a family. This isn't a way to kick things off in your marriage. And the problems he is facing had to be beyond anything he was equipped and experienced to deal with. And you can imagine at this point, he, he, most people would just want to throw in the towel, right? I want to give up. But he doesn't. You see, Joseph presses on. 
Though sometimes it doesn't look like it, and though sometimes it doesn't always feel like it, he knows that, that God still loves him anyhow. And somehow, God is working in the midst of it. God is working for his good. And God was still in control. How many of you ladies, if you were nine months pregnant, would have wanted to go on this 80-mile journey on the back of a donkey? Any? Takers? Adventurous? No? And 80 miles, that wasn't like a day's journey. This is multiple days. You would think, ideally, after 80 miles on the back of a donkey, like when you get there, maybe you'd get a hot bath, right? Maybe, maybe somebody, when you're pregnant, to massage your feet. Ladies, did you like that? Yeah? Massage those feet. A warm meal. Maybe, maybe a comfortable bed. But instead, when you show up, all you get is a stack of hay, and you've got to share that with a bunch of barn animals. But then, not only that, to make matters worse, I can imagine Mary, she's in the stable. All right, this is, she's resigned herself. This is where we're going to be. My experience is most ladies at that point still try to tidy things up, right? Can't just leave the hay all unorganized and unsorted. We we had to clean up a little bit. I, I can imagine Mary just sorting things, organizing, getting everything unpacked and just making it as homey as she can in the moment. And then all of a sudden, oh! That was more than a kick. Oh! That was a contraction. Oh! Now what? And Joseph saying, breathe, breathe, right? I went through Lamaze training. But can you imagine this? In the stable of all places. No woman wants to give birth in a stable. And I can imagine Mary just just praying, God, can't this wait for a couple more days? Can't we get home? Can't we get back? Does this have to be now? Can you just, Lord, you're God of the universe. You can postpone this, right? I can imagine the dialogue between Mary and God in this moment. These are false contractions, right, Lord? Yeah. No. God didn't wait. He had his reasons and his purpose for having his son born into a lonely, dirty stable. And the baby Jesus was born there. It appears from the verses that she didn't have any help. There wasn't doctors. We we don't see any midwives mentioned. In fact, if you read the story carefully, I don't even know if Joseph was in the room at the time. Interesting. Just Mary and the animals. Now it's Hard to say, but I I suspect Mary probably broke down and cried at this point, right? I would have. Overwhelmed. I mean, remember, she's at the most probably 17 years old and maybe as young as 14. First child. Never had a kid before. And this is not the way that she thought this miraculous baby was going to be coming into the world. I imagine Joseph probably cried too. This isn't what he wanted for his young wife. This isn't where he wanted his son to be born. And and on top of that, he had to feel completely useless because there was nothing he could do about it. And as a man, I can tell you, those are terrible emotions to be feeling. Helpless. I'm a man. I I, want to help. I want to do... Give me something to do. And when I can't do anything, it's torture. But that's the way it happened. And according to Luke 2, 7, Mary when the baby is born, takes and wraps him in the swaddling clothes and lays him in the manger. Again, a manger? That that doesn't meet the government regulations for safety for a crib. Right? Uh -uh. I I wouldn't even want to put my son in this one when he was a newborn. I remember being at the hospital holding that little guy going, I'm responsible for this. Right? I I didn't want to let him out of my hands. And all she has is a manger and a stable. No sheets. no, No cute little jammies with little footballs or baseballs on them. Right? 
a feeding trough with some hay in it to lay her newborn child on. That was it. And I can imagine this distresses Mary and Joseph both. You can see them just sitting in the stable. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Right? She sang some songs. Right? Maybe she sang that one. But they wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and I don't want you to miss that, because it is an important point. You see, these swaddling clothes that, that Mary wraps him in when she places him in the manger are a symbol of things to come. Swaddling clothes, if you don't know what they are, are strips of linen, and, and you wrap them around a child. And we, we, we had these little things that were awesome. They had Velcro on them and, and for swaddling. And you could put my son in them, and you whoosh, and you'd Velcro that thing down, and he'd be like a little baby burrito. And he would be so happy. Whatever it is, God created children to love that, that sensation of being wrapped up tight. Because they spent the last months, you know, last nine months, basically, constrained. And so when you, you swaddle them, they're actually more comfortable. And Mary takes these strips and she, she wraps her baby in them. And it's an interesting, interesting picture of what is yet to come. Because here it would be about 33 years later that Jesus would come and again be wrapped in strips of linen. But this time, they put him in a cave. They put him in the grave. And in both instances, things changed dramatically. In both instances, at Jesus' birth and three days after his death, just when the night was darkest, just when those who loved Jesus the most, his parents at birth and, and his disciples at death, just when they begin to wonder, did God forget us? It was in those two moments where an angel appeared to announce change. You see, there was this uncaring tyrant who had caused Joseph and Mary so many troubles. But they endured. Without complaining, without becoming bitter, and as a result, God acts on their behalf and changes everything. He sends an angel of the Lord to say, I haven't forgotten about you. I am with you. And in verses 8 through 20, we begin to see that the troubles turn into triumph. Beginning with verse 8. It says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. See, these shepherds, they were out watching over what would be the Passover lambs. The lambs that would be sacrificed later in the year. So it is an, an appropriate thing that they would go and look over yet another Passover lamb who would be sacrificed later in his life. Verse 9 says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And here again we see that, that, that fear comes upon people when they encounter angels. It's not a, a sense of peace. It's not... You know, bells and whistles and tingles when an angel shows up. But it's the fear, the fear of the Lord. And so they were afraid. But the angel says to them in verse 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news and great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And so the angel, he tells the shepherds who are out in the fields watching their flock by night of the birth of Christ and that he is going to be their Savior. And this is where you're going to go find him. And then it says in 13, and then suddenly there was with an, with the multitude, with an angel there a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest and peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's interesting to note that Caesar Augustus wanted to be hailed as God. And through his selfishness, he sets into motions events in which the true God will come to earth and be praised by angels. 
And not only that, but, but history tells us that Caesar Augustus was actually praised in his time for having inaugurated worldwide peace. But we know it wasn't a real or lasting peace. That's not where real peace comes from. The angels proclaim that Christ will bring peace. Peace doesn't come through money. Peace doesn't come through power of the empire. Instead, peace comes into this world through humility and service. And the all-important peace with God comes only to those who believe in Jesus. Only those who believe in Jesus for eternal life. Because the Bible is abundantly clear that it is only through Christ that we can have lasting peace. That is the very message that the angels proclaim. That the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is the original Christmas gift, given for you and given for me, that Jesus came for all of mankind. But unfortunately, not all of mankind is willing to receive him. You see, in Isaiah 48, 22, God tells us that there is no peace for the wicked. And we live, we know, we live in a wicked and sinful, broken world. And those who live in wickedness and sin will never have peace. That is the way of the world. But if, however, you are one of those who have come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior by believing in Him and Him alone for eternal life, then you can have the peace that these angels are proclaiming. Romans 5.1 states, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that offer is available to all of us today. Peace is available to you if you are willing to be a person living in God's will. What is God's will? To believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life. That is God's will. In John chapter 6, some people come to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, what must we do to do the work of God? What is God's will? And Jesus said to them, This is the will of my Father, that you believe on Him whom the Father has sent. That's it. Believe in Jesus for eternal life. That is the will of God. If you want to have the peace that the angels proclaimed here, you need to be a man or a woman of God's will. You need to do God's will. You need to believe in Jesus for eternal life. It is that simple. But if you reject Him, you choose to reject peace as well. There can be no peace in this world without Him. Continuing on, verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and a baby lying in a manger. You see, as, as the angels disappear, as the angels go back into heaven, the shepherds say, hey, let's go. And so they did. They were men of action. And it says they came with haste. This was the very first Christmas rush, right? Certainly different than our Christmas rush. I was over in Brainerd the other day trying to navigate my way through some stores on, on Friday, and it was a zoo. And it wasn't a Christmas rush like that with these shepherds, though. They were rushing to see Jesus. I wish we were all more like these shepherds. They heard the word of God spoken here by angels and they immediately acted upon it, right? They didn't wait around until it was morning. They didn't ask for better directions. Can you imagine them saying, uh, uh, Hey, Mr. Angel Michael, um, you know, there's a, there's a number of stables in Bethlehem and the streets, well, they're not, they don't have street signs everywhere and my smartphone's GPS is on the fritz. Can you give us some better directions to find Jesus? Right? They couldn't Google it. They, they, they didn't have a navigation system. They received by faith the message of God. And then they responded with immediate obedience. And we should note that the angels, the angels they didn't appear to kings, right? They didn't appear to the, the mayor of Bethlehem. 
They didn't appear to the religious leaders back in Jerusalem. The angels appeared to shepherds. Just humble shepherds out working in the field. You should know about shepherds that they were the outcasts of Israel. Because their work as shepherds made them ceremonially unclean. But not only were they unclean, but because of their job and their duties, because they were out in the fields continually, it kept them away from the temple for week after week after week, so that they didn't even have a chance to become purified. Mary's song, back in, in Luke 1, 51 through 53, kind of pointed some of this out. That it would be a, a pattern in the life of Christ that the poor, and that the people who were basically nobodies in the world, those were the ones that God often gives His special attention to. And then in verse 17 it says, And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. The shepherds became the very first Christian evangelists. The very first witnesses to begin to spread the good news of the Messiah. When they saw Jesus Christ, they couldn't help it. They couldn't keep silent about it. They had to tell everybody that they met. And again, I think there's some lessons in there for us. Not only did they obey God's word and immediately respond, but then they went out and went beyond that and told others about Jesus. Once you have seen Jesus, it, it's a privilege, it's an honor, and it's a necessity to go and tell others about Him. Once you've truly seen Jesus, you can't help but to tell others. And the shepherds were so excited about this, about what they had just seen and what they had just heard, that they just had to tell everybody. And look at the results in Luke 2.18. It says, All who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. This is a key idea after all that we've seen today. Things didn't go as planned for, for Mary and Joseph. They'd experienced more trouble along the way than they probably deserved. And rather than complain, rather than criticize, they quietly accepted what God was doing. Joseph could have blown his own horn and said, Hey, I'm related to somebody important. I'm in the lineage of the King David. But he didn't. Mary could have gone around bragging, I'm carrying the Christ child. Nobody else is. Ha, 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 ha. Right? But she didn't brag about that. She didn't brag about being the mother to the Messiah. They probably could have walked in and demanded the best room somewhere, asked the innkeeper to kick some lowly people out. But they didn't. Mary and Joseph chose to humbly accept the trials and troubles that God had sent their way. And as a result, God lifted them up. He raised them up. He sent angels to, to blow the trumpet for them and the shepherds to pass the word for them about who they were and what kind of child they were having. Instead of having to do it themselves, God proclaimed the message for them. A great lesson in that for all of us. We don't have to make much of ourselves. If we're doing the work of God... God will make much of us for it. We see this lesson again in Luke 2, 19 through 20. It says, But Mary, she treasured up all of these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Mary didn't go around telling people about how blessed and special she was and how great she was. Instead, she kept them in her heart and pondered it. And then God used the shepherds to tell the world about Mary and her newborn babe. Do you have gifts and abilities that God has given you? Of course you do. All of us do. Great and incredible gifts and abilities that you can do astounding things to the glory of God for. But God doesn't want you to go around bragging about that. He didn't give you the gifts that you might make much of yourself. He didn't make you blessed so that you might have other people honor and glorify you. Instead, we need to be like Mary and Joseph. Quietly and humbly, obediently 
working. Whatever our position and privilege might be, wherever God has placed us, being faithful in the things that He has given us. Paul writes in Philippians 2 that we should be like Christ. And I suppose we could say also a little bit like Mary and Joseph as well, for for making themselves of no reputation and acting like a servant to everybody, humbling themselves to the greatest extent possible. And as a result of that, God highly exalted them and lifted and raised them up. And in that, Jesus' name was lifted above every name. His name will be lifted above all names on the earth. And the Bible tells us that in that, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So in this season, be obedient. In this season, share the love of Christ. In this season, humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. As we go forth, may we take the light and the love and the joy of Christ in the celebration of Christmas. Amen. Let's pray.